corrected in some way, shape, or form. But the church of Philadelphia is one that is not correcting. In other words, they're just commending on things that they're doing well. They're commended on being this strong church and this model church. And so I want to kind of approach it with that way because it can obviously be a model for us as a body of believers, but it can also be a model for us as believers individually to look at the example that Christ commends so highly. And as I've dug in the church of Philadelphia over the last year or so, there's two or three things that have just jumped out at me that I think are very significant for the body of Christ to consider. Um, the, the passage that is in is, is verses 7 through 13 in the book of Revelation. And that's the church at Philadelphia. And let me read that to you. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man can take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, there's a, as we examine the church of Philadelphia tonight, there's going to find that there's a couple, three different ways that we can apply this to our life. And uh, uh, we have to understand that when these were letters were written to these churches, at this point in time, this was actually a physical church. This was a church that existed. This was a church in Philadelphia. And at that point in time, Jesus, through the, uh, through the Apostle John, sent a letter to these churches and to the leaders of those churches and to the pastors and corrected those churches. But the church in Philadelphia, he doesn't really correct them. And if you just notice, he just commends that church. Now, what I want to present to you tonight is that that doesn't only have an application to them, but that actually has a prophetic application to us in the day and the hour we live. And, and I'm going to demonstrate that to you. There are many people who believe that the seven churches also represent, maybe you could call seven times, seven seasons, seven ages, whatever word you want to use, in, in church history, and that at the end of times, at the end of the church age, we see two churches coexisting, and that would be the church of Philadelphia and the church of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea is the church that Jesus chastised them for being lukewarm. He says, you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. And, and he says, I will spew you out of my mouth. And so the one at, at, at uh, Laodicea is the most strongly corrected. And the one in Philadelphia is the most strongly commended. I personally, in the day and hour we live, I see that very graphically in the time that we live. I mean, we see the body of Christ in many areas is just really stirred up in revival and the fires of God are there. But we also see on the other side, a lot of churches are really going the other direction. And they're very lukewarm, and, they're, and, and, the, and the Spirit of God is not moving there, and the Word of God is not going forth, and you can just see them on the decline. And I think very obviously that's something that's prophetically happening in our time. But I want to show it to you tonight a little bit in the Scriptures. If you want to look at your Bible, look at verse number 10. Because thou hast kept thy word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So according to verse 10, Jesus is speaking to this church and telling them that, that he is going to keep them from a trial or a temptation that comes upon all the earth. He is going to keep them from a trial or temptation that comes upon this entire planet. Now, I don't know about you guys, but the way I understand the Word of God, there's only one time biblically when there's going to become a trial or a temptation that's going to come upon the entire earth or upon the whole earth. And that's the time that we refer to as the, as the tribulation or the great tribulation, the seven-year period of time after the rapture of the church and before the second coming of Jesus Christ. So if that is correct and that is true what I'm saying, then this must be a church that is also prophetic. This must be something that is not only a, a literal church that exists 
at that time, but also something that Jesus is speaking of that is of a prophetic time that is going to exist. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to spare you from that seven year tribulation, that seven years of trial. So if that's the case, then this very much can be used as an example or a model of a last day revival church. And I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's no other way to interpret that scripture. There's no other way to interpret that verse. Now, somebody might look at me kind of funny and think, wait a second, Pastor, I don't know what you're talking about. How can that be an example then? How can that be a real church then and also be a model of something that's in the future? And you, and you, you must understand something, that the Word of God does that quite often. We find that all the time in the Word of God. That's not uncommon at all. As a matter of fact, throughout the entire Old Testament, that's basically what the Old Testament is. The Old Testament is a model or an example of Christ coming. It's a model and example. Everything in the Old Testament in some way, shape, or form represents Jesus. I mean, if you remember right, there was a time in the wilderness where, where all the, the Israelites were grumbling and complaining because there wasn't enough water and they're thirsty and Moses goes to God and, and cries out to God and says, God, what am I going to do? They're bumbling and complaining about they're thirsty, there's no water. What do you want me to do? And God told Moses, I want you to go and take your rod and smite that rock one time and I'm going to have water gushing out of that rock. And we know that Moses went and he, he actually did it twice, which he was instructed to only do it one time. And, and because of that, Moses didn't get to lead the Israelites into the promised land. The reason is, is that rock or that stone represented Christ, and he was only to be spent one time. But we see that, that he spent that rock, and, and water come gushing out of that rock, out of that rock, and enough water for all the people of their livestock. And at one time I, I did a study on that because I was curious how many people that was talking about. Was it talking about a handful of people? And the best of my estimates at that point in time, the Israelites were probably a little bit larger than the population in the city of Chicago. So a whole lot of water came out of that rock. A whole lot of water came out of that stone. And we understand later on in the Word of God, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it makes it very plain that that rock was Jesus and that water was the Holy Spirit. And so that rock that Moses hit, that rock that Moses spit in the wilderness and the water came out was actually a model or an example or a type of something that was literally coming in the future. You see, we can find that all through the scriptures. There was a little bit later, right after that, the Israelites were, were mumbling and complaining again and the serpents came in and bit them. And Moses again went to God, cried out to God, what do I do, God? And God told him, he said, take a serpent and put it upon a pole and hold it up and everybody who looks at that serpent will be healed. And Moses did in the instructions of the Lord. He took that pole, he put the serpent on it, he held it up, and everybody who looked at that serpent and put a pole was healed. And we know later on in the New Testament, it tells us again that that represented Jesus Christ and his healing provision for people. So it's not a bit unusual for God to use something today that is actually a model or example of something that's coming. The temple, the tabernacle in the Old Testament all represented Jesus Christ. And in some way, shape, or form, you can break it down, and all of that shows Jesus Christ and reveals Jesus Christ. So if we stop and consider this for a moment, what I'm saying about that verse, that would not be in any way, shape, or form unusual for God to do something like that. So we can look tonight at Philadelphia as a model or an example of a revival church. Now, I want to... And for some reason, whenever I talk about a model of a revival church, the Lord always brings something back to my remembrance. And I may have shared this with you before, but there was a time in a church that I went to, and they were in a small building, and it was a small church, but they had the model made of this brand new building they were going to build. And when you go into that church, if you as a visitor, I guarantee you that they would grab you and take you back and show you that model church and tell you about one day when they were going to build that church and how wonderful it was going to be and how beautiful it was going to be. I mean, they were fired up about that. And that church actually exists today. They built that church. They built that model. They built that example. But you see, that was a model of something that was going to happen in the future. And so we look at the church of Philadelphia as a model and an example of something that very well could be prophetically happening right now in the time and the day and the hour that you and I live. You see, that's how God does things. I, you've heard me use this example before, but I want to use it again to illustrate something. I've asked you before, you know, you, you, as an example of faith and how faith works, and faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and, and, that, and that's actually rhema, the Greek word, that calls out the Holy Spirit speaking the word of God into your spirit. And I've asked a question before, I say, you know, anybody who's a believer, anybody who 
who's a Christian, if he was asking, do you believe Jesus is real? He's going to say, well, of course I believe Jesus is real. You have to believe Jesus is real to be born again, don't you? And he's saying, well, how, have you seen Jesus? Well, most of us haven't, have we? I've never seen Jesus with my eyes. I've never touched him with my hand. I've never heard his audible voice. He speaks to me all the time in my spirit, but I, I've never heard his audible voice. I've never experienced Jesus with any of my senses. But yet I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is real. Because God's word and God's spirit has created that reality on the inside of me. I know Jesus is real, even though I've never experienced it with any of my senses. And I go down the line and I can ask the question about, how many of you believe that heaven is real? The Christians, I say, well, of course I believe heaven is real. I say, how many of you have actually experienced heaven with your physical senses? Some people have been into heaven and some people have had visions of heaven. I personally have not. But I believe heaven's real. I've never seen heaven with these eyes. I've never heard heaven with these ears. I've never smelled heaven. I've never experienced heaven in any way, shape, or form with my five senses, but I know that heaven's real. Why? Again, because God's word and God's spirit has created that reality in my heart. And the same thing, if we're to be a revival church, and we're to understand a revival church, and we must understand what God meant by a revival church in the last days, and then it would come to us the same way. We would have that vision on the inside of our hearts. We would have that vision on the inside of our spirit of God showing it to us in his word, and the spirit of God bringing that revelation into our life and showing us what that church would look like. So he would obviously say, hey, let's found this church in Philadelphia that is doing exactly what I want the last day church to do. Let's hold it up as an example. Let's record it in the word of God. So at that time now, they can read it, they can look at it, they can study it, they can preach it and teach it so that revelation will come alive on the inside of them and they can walk as that revival church. So there's a lot to learn here. If that's true, and I believe with all my heart it is, then I want to understand this church in Philadelphia. And I want to understand it well. Amen? Amen. Amen. You say, well, I don't know about all that, Pastor. Maybe this don't apply to me. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 13. Hallelujah. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So, obviously, what I'm teaching tonight and showing you tonight applies to anybody who has a spiritual ear. If you can hear God tonight, this applies to you because God's saying if you have an ear to hear the Spirit of God, then hear what the Word says here. Receive this understanding. Receive this revelation. And every time I touch upon this, I always like to take a moment and share something with you. You do understand that spiritual revelation is a choice we make. We choose whether or not we walk in the light. We choose whether or not we walk in the darkness. We choose whether or not we walk in the revelation of God's word or whether we don't walk in the revelation of God's word. That's a choice we make. I always use the example. You've heard me talk about this before. I mean, just right now, there are people all over town who have chosen not to hear God's word tonight. There are people all over town who chose not to hear God's word this morning. Churches all over had, had services and, and were teaching and preaching God's word, but people made a choice, a willful choice, to choose to stay home and stay in the darkness and not know what God's word says. People made a willful choice to do that. We have all kinds of opportunity in the day and the hour we live. I can take out my telephone and get all kinds of teaching and preaching on it right now. I have a choice. I can choose to listen to that. I can choose to learn God's word, or I can choose not to learn God's word. I can choose to walk in darkness, or I can choose to walk in revelation of God's word. I can choose to hear from God tonight, or I can choose to ignore God tonight. The Bible talks about it in Matthew chapter 13, where it talks about people who are walking in darkness. It says, they have closed their eyes. They made a choice. They made a willful choice. It says, I'm going to close my eyes to the things of God, and I'm going to walk in darkness. So we can make a choice tonight, and we can learn from the church in Philadelphia, and we can say, yeah, I want to hear what the Lord says. I want to hear what the Spirit of God has to say tonight. I want to understand this revival church, Lord, so I can understand how to walk as a believer, to walk in revival. You see, we all want to pray for revival. We all want to talk about revival. But as I keep telling people, beloved, to see revival, we have to be revival. If we're not revival, we're not going to see revival. If we're not walking in revival as believers, we're certainly not going to see revival. Because if I'm wanting to see revival and not be revival, I'm just wanting to be a spectator. I'm wanting a good Holy Ghost show. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we're going to choose revelation tonight.
tonight. Amen? We're going to choose to walk in the things of God. You know, the Bible tells us, and this is something that I've been emphasizing a great deal lately. You see, we should pursue God's revelation. We should pursue an understanding of God's Word. The Word of God tells us we're to attend to God's Word. We're to incline to God's Word. We're to search her out as hidden treasure. This we got to realize, you know, that this is the greatest treasure on planet Earth. And we're to seek it out and search it out and get understanding and pursue that. That's a choice that we need to make. Amen? I don't know why I've been pounding on that so much lately. Maybe that's something we need to get. Let's go back to, to Revelation chapter 3. And here's the kind of the key point that I've come away with in the last few weeks and going back to this kind of in a fresh way. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. Jesus is telling the church in Philadelphia they have an open door. Now, I think this applies to us as a church, this applies to the body of Christ, and this applies to our own personal life. We want open doors, don't we? We want open doors as a church. We want open doors as believers. And so when we look at this, Jesus is telling them, I set before you an open door. And what I want to look at tonight a little bit is why is that door open? You see, we should ask that question right away. Well, Jesus talked to the church in Philadelphia, and that's an example for us, and that's a model for us, and he said that before them is an open door, that I should get an understanding of why the door is open. Because I want to walk in the same thing they're walking in, so I can have an open door in my life. So I can have an open door in the church. I want an open door, don't you? How many of y'all ever try to run into closed doors? You guys never did that, did you? You never run into the brick wall? Whoo! <laughs> he says, I have set before thee an open door. I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Now he says there's an open door, and then he immediately says there's three reasons why there's an open door. Why? Because they have a little strength. Why? Because they've kept his word. Why? They have not denied his name. So we have to ask ourselves that simple question. Does that sound like us? Can we examine these scriptures tonight and find out what that's talking about? What is that talking about having a little strength? What is that talking about keeping his word? What is that talking about not denying his name? You see, beloved, he says very specifically there, because of these things, thou hast an open door. And not only do you have an open door, but no man can close it. In other words, you're an unstoppable force. A revival church like the church in Philadelphia has an open door that no man can shut. Nobody can stop them. They are an unstoppable force upon the planet. Everybody looking at me kind of funny. That's what it says. The government can't shut it. The richest man in the world can't shut it. The most powerful army in the world can't shut it. There's an open door, and he says that no man can shut that door because of these three things. You have a little strength, you've kept my word, and you've not denied my name. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I examine Philadelphia as a revival church, the first thing I do when I come across that phrase, little strength, is stumble. Because that doesn't sound like a revival church to me. A little strength. I mean, don't you think of a revival church that God would look at you and say, Woo, boy, you got the power. A lot of strength. A lot of power. But he says a little strength. I don't know. That don't sound like that big of a compliment to me. God say, come up to me and say, Mike, you got a little strength. Wow. <laughs> so when I began to, first began to study the church of Philadelphia, that phrase really threw me. And you know, maybe me the great Bible scholar here, I thought, you know what? I'll just dig into the language. Surely that'll show me something. I'll look at some commentaries. Surely I'll figure it out there. And I looked at the commentaries, and I, and I found most of their explanations to be honestly useless. Says, oh, they just must have been a church that was little in size. Well, I began to think that. So, so you're telling me that God looks down at a church and determines how much strength they have by how big they are? So we got a church today maybe on this planet of 10,000 people that
that's a very watered down church, and you had Jesus and the 12 apostles, and that 10,000 uh, member church that's real watered down is more powerful than Jesus and the 12 apostles. Well, that wouldn't make sense, would it? But when the Bible talks about where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. That wouldn't make sense. What about the, the 120 on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them and filled them up and they magnified God and glorified God and spoke in tongues and Peter stood up and preached one sermon? 5,000 people came to them. Is it because they were 120 they were of little strength? I don't think it has anything to do with numbers. I, I don't think the commentaries are getting it there. I, I don't think they're thinking it through very well. But some said, you know, that church is just a, a church that's just the end time church and, and they're just barely hanging on and, and it, you know, they're by that little thread and, and, and everything's coming apart on them and everything's falling apart on them and I thought, well, why would God give them an open door? If they're just hanging on and they're not ready to backslide, why would God give them an open door? That doesn't make sense either. So I began to study the words of God. I'm going to find out what this says. I looked up the word little. And you know what? It gave me a great revelation. It means little. Well, that didn't help. It means small. Strength. I looked at that. I looked that Greek word up. I knew a word study there. And that'll help me. And strength it did. It. it took me farther back. It said unimus. And most of us know what the Greek word dunamis means. You shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive dunamis when the Holy Spirit's come upon you. So that word dunamis is a word that's used in his miracle working power. And so he's commending the church at, at Philadelphia saying, you have a little bit of miracle working power. And I'm saying this is a revival church. And then I had to kind of process this a little bit. I thought, wait a second. Who says something has a great bearing upon how we understand what's said, don't we? Let me give you my goofy illustration I often use for that. <coughs> Imagine that <coughs> me and Eli come walking in to the church. And Eli said, man, that dude just beat me in basketball. Well, no big deal, is it? I mean, Eli, he's just big. I said, hey, son, I forgot to get hunting I am. Let's go. And I walk in, and maybe I walk in with the next person. He's a little bit bigger than me. And, and he said, man, this dude just beat me in basketball. But that, big deal. That doesn't get any attention, does it? I just beat Eli, and I just beat this, this other guy in basketball. But back to me and LeBron James walk in. You know who LeBron James is, a basketball player? Y'all look at me in these big looks. And LeBron James says, man, that dude just beat me in basketball. Suddenly, all of you pay attention to What? Really? He beat you? How in the world did that happen? They said the exact words, but it had a completely different impact by who said it, didn't it? See, when Eli said, that dude just beat me in basketball, I was like, oh, no big deal. Except Eli can see it kind of perk. I'm like, yeah, let's try that something. You can see it don't lie to that. <laughs> but when LeBron James says that, then suddenly the words have a completely different impact. See, God says if you have a little strength, this is the same one who told Peter that he had a little faith when he walked on water. You see, the example that I use to help us understand this, we can say, boy, you know, last week, and the week before that and this week, we've had some powerful worship services, haven't we? And we have. The Spirit of God's moved powerfully. In our frame of reference, they were powerful services. Because while we determine whether or not a service is a powerful service or not, we're comparing it to all the other services we've been in. I didn't play that was the most powerful worship service I've ever been in. God might look at it and say, eh, drop the water, I got an ocean for you. You see, when God talks about a little power, in our frame of reference, it could be a whole lot of power. So God's telling Philadelphia, you got a little dunamis. You got a couple drops of water here. You see, God is not looking at our experience from what we've had in the past. God is looking at what's available. Say, yeah, you've 
got a little power in the Holy Ghost. But you see, beloved, he doesn't mention to any of the other churches about them having any power in the Holy Ghost. So one of the first things we understand here then is that the revival church is a church that has the power of the Holy Spirit in their midst. They have some dunamis going on. They got some miracle working power happening in their very midst. The miracle working power of God is being manifest. To be a revival church, we got to be a church that's walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. To be a revival believer, to be somebody who's walking in revival, somebody who's being revival, we have to be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, that's the, the we're going to look at this one of the key elements. But he also goes on and says, hey, you've kept my word. The word keep there doesn't mean like I'm going to keep this. You know, that's how I think to keep. You know, I'm going to keep that. It means to guard, to watch over, and to protect. So it says, you've got some power in the Holy Ghost. And you keep my word. You watch over my word. You protect my word. You guard my word. You know what? I always go back, and, and, and I don't know if you've ever heard me share, use this example before. The example that Charles Spurgeon was an old preacher a long time ago gave. And he said, you know, how do you guard God's word? How do you protect God's word the same way you do a lion? I mean, if I got a lion in my backyard, he's tied up. And, and a bunch of people keep coming by and throwing rocks at that lion and, 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 and messing with it. How would I do? What would be the best way to break that lion? Just turn it loose. And you only throw rocks at it one time. Because then he would eat you. I don't have to protect him and guard him. I just have to turn him loose. How do we keep and protect God's word? It's simple. We preach it. We teach it. We live it. We believe it. And just let God's word do its work. Because the Bible itself says that God's word will not return to us void. It tells me first that this is just being like a fire in the prophet Jeremiah's mouth. And, 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 the, and the Israelites just clay. And we first this as a hammer that just breaks up the strongholds. You see, beloved, we keep God's word by standing on God's word. We keep God's word by protecting God's word. We keep God's word by living God's word. We keep God's word by believing God's word. A church that is keeping and guarding the Word of God is a church that's standing up and preaching the Word of God without compromise. A church where the people are standing on God's Word without compromise. A church that's living God's Word no matter what the time and the society might be telling them, they're standing on the Word of God. Everybody in your life may say otherwise, but you're standing on the Word of God. That's keeping the Word of God and guarding the Word of God and protecting the Word of God has not denied my name. Now there's one that will give us, well, I would never deny the name of Jesus. He's talking to a church here. And if we're mindful of this at all, and we understand the book of Acts at all, we'll understand something. That was the first thing that was attacked in the early church. One of the first things. And you're going to have a great revelation tonight. Because the three things that the church of Philadelphia is committed for are the three things that the church has been attacked in throughout church history. The power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the name of Jesus are the three areas that the world and the enemy has attacked the church in. Has do not deny my name. Remember when Peter and John was going to the temple to pray? And the man was there at the gate, beautiful. And then Peter said, you know, silver, gold, have I none? What I have, give, I give unto you. Rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. And he walked over, he picked him up, put him on his feet. And boom, he was miraculously healed. And immediately the first response of the powers that be was to take them into custody and to threaten them and intimidate them to never preach or teach again in the name of Jesus. I would expect if I went somewhere and I told somebody to rise up and walk in the name of Jesus, I would expect a good response. But it was the exact opposite. And as a matter of fact, a little bit later they didn't get the point. So the powers of beat had them into custody again, and this time they had to beat, they thought they had to beat them, they beat them and told them never preach or teach 
get in the name of Jesus. Why? Because miraculous, miraculous things were happening in that name. You see, the enemy trembles at that name like nothing else. Because that name has all power and all authority. And I always use the example of, of the airport that I heard years ago. You've heard me use it before, I'm sure, but I'll, I'll mention it again. You know, when you fly into an airport, no matter that, when you come in, you can be the richest man in the world, you can have the nicest airliner in the world, and you can be behind the cheapest plane in the world, and the poorest pilot in the world, and you go right in order. He's there first, he goes first. You're there second, he goes second. Whatever that order is, that's how you land. With only one exception. And that's when they hear Air Force One. And when they hear Air Force One, everything stops. And all others are put on hold. The airport basically shut down because Air Force One's there and they get clear landing way. And then they land and everything's shut down. That's, it. That's the president's airplane. And that name has authority in our airspace like none other. And that's the name of Jesus in the spiritual world. When we say the name of Jesus, whew, heaven stops and pays attention. When we say the name of Jesus, hell stops and pays attention. That's the name of all power. That's the name of all authority. Why would the church ever deny that? Can I ask a hard question? Do you realize in Mark chapter 16 what the church is told to do in the name of Jesus? They're told to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. They're told to speak in tongues in the name of Jesus. And they're told to lay hands on the sick and they'll recover in the name of Jesus. Now, I'm not giving anybody a hard time, but if you stop and think for a moment, you might know there are some churches that don't cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Don't speak in tongues in the name of Jesus. And don't lay hands on the sick in the name of Jesus. So maybe that is something that's real. You see, a revival church is a church that's walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. A revival church is a church that's standing strong on the Word. A revival church is a church that's walking in the authority of the name of Jesus and doing what we were commissioned to do in the name of Jesus. Y'all look so thoughtful. You see, beloved, when they were told not to preach or teach anymore in the name of Jesus in Acts chapter 3, they immediately went to a prayer meeting. And they immediately called upon God and asked God to move his hand. And so that signs and wonders and miracles would be done in the name of the Holy Child Jesus. And God poured out his spirit so powerfully and shook that building. And they went out and proclaimed the word of God in boldness. Now if you've got your ears tuned in, you just noticed something. What happened in that prayer meeting after they were intimidated and threatened not to do is exactly what the Church of Philadelphia is being committed for. They prayed. That signs and wonders would happen in what? In the name of Jesus. The Holy Spirit was poured out. They preached the word in boldness. The, the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the word of God. Are the three key elements to a spiritual explosion that happened in Acts chapter 2, that happened in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, and will happen today in these last days. Where there's a church that is walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Where there's a church that's standing on the word of God. Where there's a church that's exercising the revelation, their knowledge and, and authority in the name of Jesus. Where there's churches and Christians walking in that, you're going to see revival break out. You're going to see a spiritual explosion take place. It's always been that way. You know, and, and, and it's, we, we see a pattern here. You know, without going into all the details, when Jesus ministered, Jesus ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus ministered, he taught the Word of God. When Jesus ministered, he exercised his authority. When the early church, when we see them exploding on the scene, what did they do? They, they, they ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit, didn't they? They preached the Word of God, and throughout the book of Acts, you'll see those three elements. They exercised authority with the name of Jesus. And so we've got something here that we need to understand. You see, what we have seen take place, beloved, is we see that Jesus was the model. I remember a while back talking to somebody, and they were talking about how in the book of Acts they didn't have any examples, they didn't have any models, they didn't have the word. I said, wait a second, they had Jesus. They had just watched Jesus for three years and how he ministered. He ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit, he taught the word of God, and he exercised spiritual authority. And we see the early church, the Holy Spirit poured out of them, they preached the word of God, they exercised it by the authority that they have been given in the name of 
Jesus, and that's the three key elements we see throughout the book of Acts. And now we see, if we're looking at the church of Philadelphia as a last day bottle revival church, we see they're doing the same thing. The exact three things that we find in the book of Acts, the exact three things we find in the ministry of Jesus, I believe this, that maybe God never meant for it to change, and somehow or another, the body of Christ has weird, weird over here, and veered over here, and veered over here, and gotten away from the basic model, basic pattern that was laid out for us in the Word of God, and now we're coming to our senses a little bit, like the prodigal son waking up in the home, can't say, wait a second, maybe we just need to go back to the Word of God, maybe we just need to go back to the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe we just need to go back to the authority in the name of Jesus and do what God meant for us to do the whole time. And maybe then we'll walk in the revival power of God. Amen. You see, God never meant for that to change. You always look so frozen tonight. It's okay. It's okay. Hallelujah. It's okay. Stop and think, and eh, I don't want to take time to go on all the details. But probably in most of your experience and most of your lifetime, if you've been a Christian for any period of time, been around Christians for any period of time, you've seen the moving <coughs> of the Holy Spirit attacked by people outside the church and inside the church. You've seen people say it's not God. You've seen people say they don't want nothing to do with that. You probably, if you've been around very much at all, and maybe not some of the circles you're at, the number one thing that's attacked within the church, within the Bible colleges and seminaries, is the authority of God's Word. And we don't even have to get into the name of Jesus. And casting out devils, healing the sick, speaking in tongues. <laughs> Right here in our country, 
right here in our society where the enemy has greatly tried to close those doors that I just talked about. The enemy has tried to stop the church from boldly proclaiming the word of God. We've been told, we've been pressured by society, by political correctness, and everything else to step back, to hush our mouth, and let things be, and not boldly speak the word of God. That pressure has been on the church for several years now. There has been pressure on the body of Christ, and trust me, as a pastor, as a preacher, I've experienced this to a great degree over the years, a lot of pressure in the church to hinder the movies of the Holy Spirit. And there's definitely a lot of pressure not to use the name of Jesus. So that is a battle that we are fighting in the day and hour that we live. To try to close that door. You see, in the Bible, we can find a lot of examples where the enemy tried to close doors. Do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? The enemy tried to close the door. And to tell them they could not worship the one true God. And they had to practice idolatry. Remember that Nebuchadnezzar built a big golden idol. Whenever the musicians sounded, they all, everybody had to bow down to this golden idol and worship it as if it was God. And Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego refused to do it. You see, they had an open door to worship the one true God. And the enemy says, I'm going to close that door. And I'm going to use these political forces to do it. And God says, no, you can't close that door. He said, we're going to cast you into that furnace, into that fire, if you don't bow down to that idol. He said, we're not going to bow down to it. Crank it up seven times. Make it hotter. We're not going to bow down to it. Throw them in the furnace. What happened? We know Jesus came down and went to the furnace with them. They came out of it. They didn't even smell the smoke. They were not burnt. They were not singed. The enemy tried to close the door. And God says, no, no man can shut that door. I will open that door. They can worship me and not worship any idol. And nobody can close that door. Daniel was a man of prayer. And the enemy says, I'm going to stop that. And he manipulated political forces to where they made a law or decree that for 30 days that nobody could pray to any god was a leader. And Daniel did. First time he came to his prayer time, he went, opened the windows, got down and prayed. And he said, I'm going to close that door. I'm going to stop that man's right to pray. <coughs> I'm going to stop that man's right to pray. We know what happened. Doing it in the lion's den. God said, angel, shut the lion's mouth. <coughs> Came to get him out the next morning. Daniel, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> the enemy said, I'm closing that door. God said, no, you're not. Do you understand something, beloved? We don't have to back off as Christians. We don't have to back down as Christians. We don't have to back down because we believe in the moving of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to back down because we believe every word of God's word. We don't have to back down because we believe the authority in the name of Jesus. Because our God has said he will open that door and there's not a man on this planet that can close it. There's not a nation that has the power to close it. There's not enough money to close it. There's not a human being who can close it. God says stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. Stand church. A church that won't back off. A church that won't back down. A church that won't you turn to me like the man to see if you lose more. <laughs> a church that says I'm going to stand strong in the fire of God. And I'm going to trust that promise that ain't nobody can close that door. Nobody in the community. No man can close that door. That's a model of a revival church. A church <coughs> that will just go all out in the power of the Holy Spirit. That will go out in the yes. Word of God. That will go all out exercising the name, the authority of the name of Jesus. You see, beloved, there's been a wave go through the church in the last several years. In my lifetime, when the church had an inclination to back away from it. Well, if we just water down the preach a little bit, maybe more people will come. Well, you know, we, if we just stop all the people talking in tongues and, and all that stuff, maybe 
more people will be accept us. <coughs> if we just don't pray, cast out demons, we can't do that. I mean, what would the demons think? <laughs> you see, that's been the way that's been in the church. But God said, no. Don't back away from that. Stand strong and trust him for the open door. Trust him for the opportunity. Trust him for the breakthrough. You might be here tonight thinking, boy, I just wish I had a breakthrough in my life. I just told you how to get it. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Stand strong on the word and exercise your authority in the name of Jesus and don't ever back down from the enemy. Don't ever wander it down. Hallelujah. Ain't God good? If you want to be Philadelphia or you want to be Laodicea? When you've got to be standing strong in the power of the Holy Spirit, standing strong in the Word of God, exercising authority in the name of Jesus, God opened the doors that no man can shut rather than be in Laodicea and be lukewarm. And God said, I'm going to spew you out of your mouth, out of my mouth. Lukewarm was never good. Amen? Amen. Oh, well, what do we do now? <laughs>